So this will be our um, our last week of stereo work, uh, and and this week I want to uh, briefly talk about uh, well the 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 main thing we're going to talk about today is patterns. So uh, tools for tools for generating algorithmic sequences of events. Um, uh, this is this is distinct from well let's okay let me just boot the server first before we get too far ahead of ourselves. Is that uh, big enough for everybody to see? Let me know if it's not. <coughs> so for the past two weeks, we've been we've been working exclusively with uh, these little curly brace blocks, you know, where we say sig equals let's go pink noise. Mm, out dot ar two sig and we all know what this sounds like. And I need that. Make it a little quieter so we can hear ourselves here. So when when we're dealing with these functions, curly braces dot play, what ends up happening is we just make a single instance of a synth. And that's usually okay if we just want to do one evolving textural idea or just a sort of sound which can be con conceived as a single unit. But, uh, for example, if we play a sound file, you know, and then we want to uh, play a scale using that sample or, or, do, or create some texture by making many, many, many copies of that sample, uh, this effect doesn't really cut it. Uh, it's it becomes really I we we know from the previous homework assignment that it's possible to create something with um, a trigger signal that you know maybe it advances a bunch of you know it, it's it's possible but it gets kind of unwieldy and there's a much more elegant approach and that's patterns. Um, so what I would like to do first is load some sound files. I have where are they? Um, in my sounds folder, I've added a folder called Pops, and these are six different sounds of uh, a hand coming down on a PVC tube. They sound like this. And then these bottom three, I think uh, uh, there's a ring on my finger that hits the tube. So, so this has got a different sort of sound. <coughs> and while we're on the topic of buffers, we know that we can just sort of say b0 equals buffer.read s comma and then just sort of copy and paste and then we can do you know this is like the the worst possible way to do it and just changing each individual it's not very flexible it's a lot of copying paste it's a lot of text it's hard to read it takes a lot of space so um what we can do is uh, use um, some iterative techniques to fill an array with buffers by just reading through the six files in this folder. This is a useful technique to get comfortable with. So the first thing I want to do is talk about um, the method called collect. So if we have the array of integers from 0 to 9 and we c use the collect method, what this does is uh, we give ourselves the option of Evaluating a function once for each item in the uh, in the uh, collection to which collect is applied, so we can declare an argument which just passes in each one of those values, and then we do something with that value. Uh, s I, wow, that was awful. Squared is what I meant to type. So what's happening here? We have the array zero through nine integers, and we collect over that array, and we evaluate this function once for each item in the array, so ten times. And the first time, zero is passed in. So n uh, is used as a placeholder for 0. We square 0 and then collect, uh, keeps track of the new results and puts that at the corresponding index in a new array. And then we get 1 squared, which is 1, 2 squared, which is 4. And so if we run this line, we get this array, which is the input array to which this function has been iteratively applied. And collect returns a modified receiver. So collect actually 
uh, outputs a new array. So I can say, you know, new, or just give it a variable name, uh, equals this, and so now new, th that, that resulting value of, of squared values in the array, that's saved. So that's, that's how collect works. It's a very handy thing for dealing with collections of objects when you want to do one thing to all of the items in the collection and then save the results. That's where collect comes in handy. When I was learning uh, th this uh, collect and, and various iterative methods, I remember it being very difficult to wrap my brain around it initially. Um, so if you have questions on how collect works, I would be happy to answer them. Um, so let's apply collect to uh, buffers. So we let's let me save this. Um, I'll put it on the desktop. Make a new folder called stereo underscore three, um, and we'll call this code. And I'm gonna move my pops folder there. So let's go to the desktop stereo three. Paste that in there. So now uh, we can use our this process dot now executing path. So we'll say um, path name uh, dot new. This process dot now executing path dot parent path. And let's just confirm what this is giving us. We've got users composer desktop. That's good. And we want to concatenate that with uh, what are the pops? Right. That's the name of the folder. Um, uh, I did something wrong here. Oh, I think it's just that I have to do that. Yeah, okay. So we've got a string representing the path to that folder. Right. So stereo three pops, and we get the six files in there. Uh, and this is a string, and so we, we'd like to be able to return a, a collection containing the strings representing the path to the individual files. So um, this may seem a little wonky initially, but we have to keep in mind that this returns a string, right? Uh, parent path gives us a string, and we're concatenating another string. So we have to actually put all of this in another path name. Right? So we have a, so this gives us an instance of path name representing the path to um, the folder of sound files. Okay, so the next step is a method called entries. This is defined for path name, and this returns, a little hard to see in the post window, but it returns an array of path names representing the paths to the files inside that folder. Right? So here's the first sound file, here's the second. So now we have a collection of things which we want to read into buffers. Um, so we collect. Collect on this array. We pass in an argument. We can call it whatever we like, but I'm going to call it path name because that's what they are. They're instances of path name. And now uh, we just need to uh, return an array of, of buffers. We're going to, the function that in this collect method, is we're going to read each buffer, and so we take the path name, uh, each path name in succession from the uh, the starting collection, and we're going to say dot full path. And then we close collect, and the last thing we need to do is just save this. We'll just call it B, lowercase b. All right. So B is an array of path names representing these six audio files. And we collect, and what this function returns is a buffer, which we read onto the server for path name for index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we return the full path, because uh, buffer.read needs a string here. And that's what full path does. It returns a string representing the full path. So yeah, that's good. No errors. That looks good. And now we can just um, let's go ahead and just modify this pink noise function. So we can say play buff.ar. Uh, I think these are two channel 
sound files. We might fix that in just a second. Uh, and then for the buffer number, we just say B. And B is an array of buffers. See, here's the first buffer. Here's the second buffer. Here's the third buffer. So we can just say B at zero. Done action two, just kill the synth when the sound file reaches the end. And it works. Right. The perhaps not so obvious benefit of doing this is that I can freely add sound files here and take them away. And as long as they stay in this folder and this folder remains together with code.scd, then every time I run this line, run, run this, this clump, um, it just reads whatever files are in that folder. As long as they're all audio files, no problem. So that's really great, because if I, if I did it the other way, writing out each line individually, and if I took some files away or added some new ones, I'd have to be constantly modifying that clump of code. Um, so I, I realize this may take a little bit of time to digest, but it's, it's really handy just using collect as an iterative method. Okay, we got to move on. I, um, so I'm going to, we're going to, now we're going to uh, talk about, uh, before we can get into patterns, we need to get comfortable with creating synth defs. Uh, and now, uh, previously, we've just been making a set of curly braces, putting ugens inside of them, and saying dot play, which works. But this is not a very reusable approach. Um, and so uh, tutorial three in my video series is, is about um, taking sound functions and turning them into synth defs. There's basically a very simple process for doing this. Uh, we make a new synth def, open parentheses. This synth def needs a name. We're just going to call this play. Um, and instead of playing that, we're going to dot add at the end of that. So we have a new synth def which has two things, a symbol name and a sound function. And we're going to add that to the server. And the other thing we need, which in this case we happen to already have, is an instance of an out ugen. If you want to actually output sound and hear sound, you have to um, include an out ugen. So um, because if we if we take this away, you know, synth def is generating the signal but then not actually outputting it anywhere. So now we can run this line. It doesn't make sound, but we see that we have created a synth def. And so now in order to use this synth def, we create a new instance of a synth which is the corresponding object. And I believe if we just do this, we should get sound. Right. So that works. Um, and we have hard-coded our synth def to always be two channels, to always play this particular sound file, to always output to hardware output bus 2. So this is not very flexible. We, re we can play this all day long, but we have no variation. So a very important thing to do is to add arguments to your synth def, which have to go at the very top. <coughs> and uh, these arguments are, are things which you'd like to modulate or vary in, in the course of producing synths. So a very uh, sensible one is the buffer, which we'll just initialize to 0. Um, and uh, also probably the output bus because and so then we uh, we replace this with buff we replace this with out and um, the, the reason we want to make an output bus argument is because if you're working at home uh, you probably want to use output bus zero like on your laptop but here in studio X uh, output bus two makes sense because of how the interface is connected to the mixer and then while we're here we might as well just add some other ones right how about playback rate initialized to 1, so we'll add that. Um, and then I'd also like to decide where in the sound file we start. So I'm going to skip ahead to start pause and make a variable, sorry, an argument there as well, which I'll initialize to the zeroth frame, so it always starts at the beginning. And I think that's good for now. Uh, I did something wrong. Comma. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I forgot the comma after S pause. Okay, so now still works. 
um, it's now defaulting to the buffer with buff num zero, which is the, the very first buffer we loaded. So now we can, uh, when we make a new synth, we can tell it which synth to have to play, and then comma, an argument of argument value pairs. So maybe we'll say buff um, b at three, comma, rate, let's keep it at one for now. We can say rate 0 0.9. So just take a, we'll take a step back for a second and, and think about what we've done. Um, the analogy I like to use for synthdef and synth compared to um, a just a simple curly braces function dot play <coughs> is um, uh, synthdef is like writing the recipe for a cake, and synth dot new is the act of baking and or eating the cake. So once you write the recipe, you don't need to write the recipe ever again, right? You can use that recipe to eat as many cakes as you want. Right? You can just go crazy on those cakes. Um, but with function dot play, the, the sort of simpler shortcut version, you know, just this kind of thing, uh, what we're doing is we're writing a new recipe, baking and eating it all in one every time. Um, and so that's it's just, um, it's like the whole thing is sort of gone after we're done, you know, and if we want to make another sound, we've got to run the whole bunch of code again. Um, so that this is a much more sophisticated way of <coughs> making sound, which is you define a sort of recipe for the synthesis algorithm you want to do, and then you add it on the server, it's there indefinitely, and you can then call upon that recipe when you actually want to execute it. So you can even make a, a clump of, of synths, you know, like this and just make their rates all a little bit different. And if we run this, uh, it doesn't sound particularly like we, um, I mean, if I comment out some of these, we'll hear a difference. So, so you know, it's just, it's just much more flexible and modular. Um, and let's add an envelope. Uh, we will say we'll give it an attack time and a release time. So it's going to be a very simple <coughs> sort of triangular shape. We'll hard code some curve values. And I'd like the, I'd like the envelope to determine when the synth dies rather than play buff, because the envelope might be shorter than the sound file. And we sig equals sig times end. We'll add an amplitude argument for good measure. We need to also add attack, which will default to a short value, release a little bit longer, and amp will default to one. So now let's do one of these. Um, rate one, and let's do uh, one of the sort of rounder sound files. I can say make the release super short. So now we have. Oops. I, sometimes I, uh, the the key repeat rate is fairly quick, so or it, it it you don't have to hold down a key on this computer very long for it to get. So sometimes I hold down return a little too long, which is why we hear those hiccups. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, we've we've set ourselves up to now finally get into patterns. Okay, so we've got the ability to make a synth from a synthdef recipe. The principal pattern object, which I want to introduce, is called pbind, capital P, lowercase bind. And pbind is an object which, when played, generates a stream of events. Um, the default type of event that pbind generates when played is a note event, which is essentially creating a synth. And so pbind allows us to define uh, uh, 
a customized sequence in which we can generate a certain number of synths and each one of the synth def's arguments can be subjected to algorithmic shaping. So pbind needs a few things and they come in the form of uh, symbol value pairs. And the first thing it needs, um, well it doesn't necessarily need this, but just for clarity we usually tell pbind what type of event we want to play. 99.99% .99 of the time I use pbind in order to generate note events. And it's so common to use pbind for this purpose that note is actually the default type of event, so it's not actually even necessary. But we do need to tell pbind if we're making note events, what synth def do we want to use? Because in, in lots of cases you might have three or four or even like dozens of different synth defs, and pbind needs to know which one. So we've called ours play. So that's the one we're going to use. pbind generates a sequence of events and it needs to know how long to wait between event generations. This is done with a key or a symbol called dur. And we'll go with one beat. Um, th this is a value in beats and when we play a pbind without any sort of special arguments after play it uses the default tempo clock which has a uh, a tempo of 60 beats per minute or one beat per second so um, sometimes you might it, it's a you can accidentally sort of think of this as a value in seconds because with default settings it is it's the same thing one beat is one second and then we provide whatever we'd like uh, using the arguments in this synth def which we've provided for ourselves so we will just go with B uh, for buff we'll say b at 0. For rate, we'll keep this at 1. Uh, I need commas all over the place. Okay. Um, if we don't provide all of the arguments, it's just going to use, I believe, the default values. But I usually like to just put them in here anyway, just so I don't have to be... If, with larger pieces, I sort of find myself constantly scrolling up and down and trying to remember what arguments are there. Um, so we're just going to put them all in. Mm. Mm, that's fine. And amp. We'll actually tone this down just a little bit. Okay. And I am going to um, give this pbind a name. Lowercase p is fine. So we're just going to run this clump. Come in. Look, Ma, no hands. So this will just go forever. Here's a, a delta time, or a, a basically the amount of the amount of the number of beats between events is one beat, which is in this case equal to one second. It's playing this sound file. Playback rate is one. It's starting at a zeroth frame every time it creates an event. Attack and release. And we can stop a pattern by saying p.stop. All right. So there's so much more to patterns, but this is a, a very simple introductory example. Let's just um, we change the doer to 0.5 or 0.25. Uh, command period also works on p binds, which are playing. So uh, that's another that's another way to stop those. Uh, here's something not to do ever. Ready? Don't do this. What do you think a dur time of zero means? Means means very very bad things will happen to you. Right? So never do that. It's what you're doing is you end up uh, you get like a quick loud blurp, <laughs> and then you get the post window just barfs a bunch of stuff at you like too many nodes. And it locks up the interpreter, and I think you have to force quit. <coughs> so, just one of the many cases in audio programming where numbers can be can, can sort of look on the surface very um, harmless, but a decimal point in the wrong place or an extra zero can be can be a very bad thing. So, yeah, this is this should always be a positive value.
And if you get too close to zero, you can also have the same problem. Um, so like if with, um, let's do 0.5 again. And now look at the node tree. Yeah. So we're only seeing two, but these numbers keep changing. Uh, I'm gonna stop this and we'll, we'll make the release time a little bit longer, make these even a little bit faster. Yeah. So what's happening is playing this p-bind just automates the process of automates this process basically. So it's like p-bind puts its hand on command and return and just starts mashing away and and constantly changing the numbers exactly to our specifications. So it's it's spewing multiple synths onto the server, but done action two is there and. Um, so those free themselves. When you're just when you're just playing a synth or a simple just a single synth by yourself and you forget done action two, it's not really a big deal. It it just hangs out on the server until you hit command period or explicitly free it. But with patterns, it can be uh, it, it's a much bigger deal because if we were to, you know, forget done action two or just go with the default of zero, then we have this situation, right? And if you look at the CPU, it's climbing. It's climbing kind of fast too. 21, 24, 25, 30, right? So we have to hit command period. So that, that's something you might run into if you forget done action two with, um, with a synth, right? If, you, if you're generating multiple events, you better have some way of destroying those events because they, they take up CPU cycles. Okay, so, so let's get into patterns some more. Uh, we obviously do not have to just make these values static. We we can um, we can use other patterns to control these. So let's um, control the playback rate, and let's do P seek capital P lowercase S E Q, and you can I'm just going to highlight this. Press Command D to bring up P seek here. Uh, it's one of many value patterns, and they all have a slightly different function. P seek outputs uh, an array of values. Um, let's put some spaces in here so this is a little bit more legible. So this is the array 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 1 1.1. And <laughs> that was good. The, our dirt time is still very short. And we need to put done action two back in here. So let's make this a little bit longer. So we've defined a miniature little sequence. So it produces, uh, if we just provide a value, then we don't really specify a certain number of those values, and pbind will just keep using that value. But rate, we've actually used a value pattern, pseq. And uh, the default, it, it basically sequences through the event, that, uh, not the event, sequences through the array that we've given it, and uses those values for the rate argument when it generates synths. And the default behavior of pseq is to just do that once, which is why we only get four events. If we put a comma after the array, we can see that the second argument of pseq is the number of repeats. It defaults to one, but we can say three. Right. Uh, and we can also say inf. And now we've got an infinite pseq. And because all of the all of the keys uh, in this pbind are either single values or infinite patterns, then pbind generates an infinite stream of note events. Everybody doing okay so far? Yeah, cool. All right, so let's look at some other patterns here. Uh, how about prand? Prand uh, picks randomly from an array of of um, <coughs> uh, values, and the default number of choices it makes is one. Right, so this isn't going to be very interesting. Uh, so we'll put a comma and we'll just say inf. So now door will randomly pick 0.2 beats or 0.4 beats. Notice that. The, this rate pattern and door pattern are just perfectly harmonious together, right? Rate is um, is still sequencing through these four values in order, forever, and prand is just choosing one of these random values. So we'll always get the same arpeggio, 
but the rhythm is a little bit um, is, is random. Um, if we want this to be more predictable, we can say pseq instead of prand. Let's make this. Um, we can do we can do math with um, arrays. So if we just and maybe we'll add another rate here. So we have a little bit of a like a five against two kind of thing happening here. So that's pseq. That's prand. Uh, let's go back to point two for our door pattern and. Um, so we know prand. We'll do. You know, think about what this is going to sound like. We've got a regular rhythm now, and now we're picking randomly from this collection. All right. Now, no surprises there. Px rand is like prand, except it will never choose the same item twice in a row. This is useful if you don't like the sort of stutteriness of picking the same sample twice in a row. Um, let's let's have this shorter, and let's look at p uh, white. P white. Uh, it's called white after white noise, which is just sort of linear randomness for each each sample value. Each sample in white noise has a uh, random value between minus one and positive one with a linear distribution. So p white is modeled after that. So if we say between 0, 0.0 and 1.0 um, length inf slow it down a little bit here so you can hear the amplitude is now yeah each each time an event is generated the amplitude is a random value between 0 and 1 uh, for p white and a few other random patterns inf is actually the default so it's not totally necessary to put comma in here. And then there's also p exp rand, which is like p white except it is an exponential distribution. This won't work if one of these values, if if this range of values includes or crosses zero. So I, if I'm doing exp rand, I usually do this. So this is going to favor values uh, that are closer to the minimum. And this is uh, a sort of a more sensible option when dealing with amplitude, because of our um, because of our uh, logarithmic perception. Um, so we w what when we when we cut the amplitude in half, uh, uh, it, it each time that that sounds like a linear decrease in intensity. So an exponential distribution mirrors that basically. So if we do this. It's you know you could argue that we get sort of a, a a better balance of what we perceive as quiet and loud. It seems like about 50/50, even though the values are tending towards the bottom. And if we do p white, um, this means that like every um, uh, it sounds going to sound like most of the values are relatively loud. It's going to sound like maybe 70, 75, 80 percent loud, medium loud. And that's because half of these values are going to be in the upper half between 1 and 0.5. And, and those are all going to sound about the same. This is, I'm kind of digressing here. So that's p white, p x brand. Um, uh, let's return to, well, we can keep p white there. And let's do p shuff. Uh, p shuff takes an array and chooses a random order of the items in that array and then repeats that specific random order uh, for as many times as you allow it to do that. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. If we do it again, so you can hear that, yeah? It's, it's uh, doing the same five pitches in, the, in that specific random order each time. Uh, what was I gonna do? Yeah, it's um, it's it's nice to be able to specify. Uh, you know, rate is controlling the perceived pitch of this sample, and these don't really tell us anything meaningful about you know what scale we're in or or what um, 
you know, what scale degrees, what harmonies. So um, there are actually a few different ways you can specify pitch information. And let's see if it's here at the bottom of the, it's not there. Uh, there's something in the, yeah. In the, in the pbind help file, there's a sort of hierarchy of pitch information. So we, um, we're not actually providing any of these. We're, we're saying rate, and rate is not part of this. But I believe um, uh, like note and degree, uh, if we, if we want to specify that, zero represents middle C. And then uh, let's, let's actually explore that. But if we specify, um, you know, uh, what is it, note zero, and if we were to sort of comment this out, then we're just going to get uh, this rate value each time. I think, oh, what did I do? Comma. Forget my commas. And if we change note, it still doesn't do anything. Um, what we need to do is put freak or, or something higher up in this hierarchy in the synth def. Um, and the frequency of middle C is like 260. One point something, uh, and what we can do then is say, uh, I believe it's um. I hope I don't get this wrong. Uh, let's, I think let's say two sixty one point six. You know what? We're gonna do sixty dot midi cps. Uh, cps, and that is two sixty one. So if we provide a note value of zero, um, then uh, I'm just I'm just trying to remember which way it is. I think it's let's try it this way. Freak, and if we can get rid of rate and say freak equals you know two sixty one point whatever. The default doesn't really matter. Um, so I there's a chance that I have accidentally inverted this ratio here. But basically when we when we get note value of zero, that's gonna translate upwards into a frequency corresponding to middle C, and that'll get plugged in here, and then that division will give us a value of one. So um, let's see if I did my math correctly. So here we have, that seems good. No, I went the wrong way, okay. So it's supposed to be freak over 60.midi CPS. So now we can do stuff like uh, p seek of zero, one, two, three, inf. Right. So that's note. Note is just zero is middle C, and an integer step represents um, a, a, a change of an integer represents a, a half step. Um, then there's degree, which um, takes into account the the default uh, scale that's being used. I believe it's just the major scale. So this should be the first four degrees of a major scale. And then if you like, you can also do MIDI note. So uh, P seek, uh, we'll say 60. 65, 70, 75, inf. Right. So now we're, we're specifying MIDI notes instead. And of course, now we can also do freak. So uh, we could say 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So by, by using this clever little ratio here, we're basically just, um, you know, we're, we're instead of specifying a rate as a playback ratio, now we can actually specify a value in hertz or any of these uh, sub keys, MIDI note, note, or degree, and we can control the pitch of our sample in a more intuitive way. This is only really this complicated when you're doing sample playback. If you're, if you're doing a synth theft that like plays an oscillator, like sine os or pulse or sawtooth or, or whatever, 
it's much much more straightforward. You just put freak in for the frequency parameter, and then all of these these uh, keys, MIDI note, note, degree, they all just sort of work. We just have to get a little bit clever with um, with a uh, play buff. Um, and this this doesn't mean that the the sample the, the default sample pitch is uh, a middle C. I mean, it's I think it's like a G or something. Uh, I don't know perfect pitch. I don't know, but uh, you know it's so you you'd have to alter this. You'd have to do a little bit more. You'd have to multiply this by yet another value to transpose. Um, you know so that when you specify a value of middle C, you actually get middle C if you're into that sort of thing. Doesn't really make a big deal. Uh, it doesn't doesn't matter too much. Um, okay, let's see how are we doing. What did I want to get into? Uh, so a few few more clever pattern things. Let's clean this up a little bit. Let's do um, uh, degree, and we'll say P seek. Just make like a, a major scale. We could we could fill in the. Um, you know, we could just say, you know, one, one through seven or whatever. Um, but we can also be do a sort of shorthand here and say uh, zero dot dot seven. I think we can also say uh, scale. Tell it which scale we want. Scale dot minor pentatonic and oh gosh is, I haven't done this in a while is this gonna work it totally is so that's the the first eight degrees of a minor pentatonic scale there's only five discrete pitches in the pentatonic scale so that's why it actually gets to the octave and keeps going so just just another way of specifying that um, it is it's so hard to not just get so distracted with all the options here um, but I want to, okay, now I'm, I'm really going to just uh, dial it back down. And uh, so, so we, point two represents a, a fifth of a beat. Right? Let's go back to one for a second. No, we'll just do, keep it even simpler. <coughs> so if we want one, to, to represent something else. Like if we want to actually think in terms of a, a tempo in beats per minute, what we can do is we can create a tempo clock. Tempo clock dot new, save it as, as lowercase t. And we provide a tempo not in beats per minute, but beats per second. And so uh, if we want 108 beats per minute, we just divide that by 60 to give us the correct value in beats per second. And uh, when you create a tempo clock, um, it's it's running, it's it's there, it's alive, it's running in the background, but it is destroyed with command period. So for that reason, I will sometimes append dot permanent underscore or permanent equals true, or alternative syntax permanent underscore true in parentheses. So um, so we create this tempo clock. And and then we uh, play on T. And so now listen to this. Now it's uh, beats in a tempo of 108 beats per minute. Um, I mean, here's 144 beats, 155 beats per minute. So you can think of these as quarter notes in whatever tempo you've provided. If we didn't make this permanent, let's just overwrite this like this. And then we played this pattern and then hit command period and tried to play it again. We get this, right? Because tempo clocks die when you press command period unless you make them permanent. And I, I like to actually think of this door value where one is a whole note. Like if you're thinking in four, four, one is a whole note and one quarter is a quarter note, one half is a half note, one eighth is an eighth note. Uh, you know, and then like, um, what would it be? And you can do you can do triplets, like if this is a quarter note, then quarter note triplets would be 
one twelfth because there's twelve of those in a measure of four four. But of course, this this doesn't work right out of the box. What you do, but you, what you can do is you can use the stretch key to stretch it out by a factor of four. So now one quarter is a beat. So if we do this, right. if we didn't do this stretch, then we'd be playing that. Right. So stretch is just like a, a, a multiplication factor so that you can deal with whatever doer values you want. Um, so from here, there's all sorts of you know fun fun patterns you can do like uh, like uh, let's make a uh, what are we gonna do uh, D I'm just making up numbers now We want these to be sixteenth notes. Let's make this eighth notes. In addition to playing a pattern on a particular clock, you can also quantize it to the next available beat. So we've got this tempo clock, and we'll say quantize it to the next uh, beat, which is a multiple of four. So now, if I play this, it may start immediately, or it may wait a few seconds. Let's do it again. So this is really convenient when you've got multiple patterns that you want to play together and have them sort of come in one after the other. We'll just uh, add 12 to this array here and cut the duration in half. So we will play that. Four, one, two, three, four. That's our metronome. So here comes this one. Yeah. I'm going to run out of, <laughs> this is not a sustainable naming scheme. Don't do this, but I'm being lazy. And we'll do, let's, let's add uh, 19. on patterns it just always devolves into a live coding jam by the end of it there's no way around it um, I think that's a lot of a lot of material to get into uh, so I will leave it there um, we'll, we'll get back to patterns in uh, at, at least two weeks um, I think we'll, we'll go back to some simple synthesis stuff as we get into quadraphonic sound next week uh, take a look at tutorial 10 um, in addition to three, which I mentioned about SynthF, tutorial 10 is about patterns. If you haven't seen it or if you've seen it a long time ago, maybe watch it again and refresh. And uh, you can go to the help documentation, browse streams, patterns, events. And the practical guide is very good uh, for a very well-paced walkthrough and then patterns themselves. There are list patterns. That's where we can find uh, PSeq. Where is it? There's PSeq. There's also PSHUF, which we saw. Um, we can look at random patterns. So there's a whole bunch of fun pattern stuff. There's a pattern for everything you can possibly imagine. And there's even um, PFunk, which uh, you, you provide a function. So you can basically customize the behavior of the pattern. And that function gets translated into pattern behavior. So if you can't find a pattern that does what you want, you can always make it yourself with pfunk. I've, I've recently started using pfunk all the time because I'm just tired of looking for the right pattern. So 
yeah, that's it. Any any questions before we stop the recording? Very good then. Um, I'll put this online as fast as I can and crank out another homework assignment for you.